Oh, yeah. Clout. What clout is in Chicago is political influence. As exercised through patronage, fixing, money, favors, and other traditional city hall methods. The best way to explain clout is through examples of the way it might be used in conversation. Nah, I don't need a building permit. I got clout in city hall. Hey, Charlie, I see a made foreman. Who's clouting for you? Ever since my clout died, they've been making me work a full eight hours. I never worked an eight-hour week before. My clout wrote a letter to the mayor recommending me for a judgeship. Maybe I should enroll in law school. Now, I hope this makes everything clear. We have to try to preserve the purity of Chicagoese and defend against efforts to cheapen one of the world's most beautiful languages. If we don't, soon people won't understand what a simple Chicago sentence, such as this, means. So this beat comes in from a goo-goo that I asked him to make the drop. But just when it looked like I was going to be vice, my Chinaman clouded for me downtown, and it was all squared. <laughs> so this beat comes in from a goo-goo that I asked him to make the drop. <laughs> Just when it looked like I was going to be vice, my Chinaman clouded for me downtown, and it was all squared. Or in a foreign language, it would mean, a complaint was made by a do-gooder that I solicited a bribe from him. Just when it looked like I was going to be fired, my sponsor intervened in my behalf, and the complaint was suppressed in City Hall. <laughs> or, as a pious payroller might say, the mayor is my clout. I shall not want... <laughs> you know, there was a time when Chicago was crawling with visiting writers all asking the same questions. What's Mayor Daly really like? Who was this chubby-cheeked man in City Hall who munched cookies with LBJ and was courted by Bobby? And whom would he support for the nomination? It was a strain for local newsmen being interviewed by visiting writers, especially the scholarly ones, they always asked if the mayor had charisma. In the mayor's neighborhood, they could get punched for talking dirty. <laughs> so to assist visitors, I prepared a primer on the mayor. Most of it wasn't new to Chicagoans, but it might help others understand our most famous citizen. It's necessary because of the many popular versions of what Daly was like. As the mayor, his most ardent admirer is described, this mayor, legend had it, first appeared during the Chicago fire of 1871. He doused the fire with one hand, milked Mrs. O'Leary's cow with the other. <laughs> Before the ashes cooled, he hired Frank Lloyd Wright to redesign the city, dug Lake Michigan to cool it, organized the White Sox, and set aside land for two airports in case airplanes were ever invented. <laughs> More restrained admirers say he's simply the greatest mayor Chicago ever had which is like singling out the best player the Cubs ever had. <laughs> the best way to view dailies and pieces, at least that's what Republicans say, is early years. 
The key to daily success is he was born in a magical old neighborhood called Bridgeport. It produced Chicago's last three mayors, their rule spanning 37 years. All this political clout got every family on somebody in a payroll. <laughs> now, out in the East, some families registered a newborn son at Harvard or Yale. In Bridgeport, they signed him on with a city water department. <laughs> Daly's father was a sheet metal worker. As a kid, Daly worked in the stockyards. This convinced him there were better things than work, so he got into politics. He showed talent. He did what he was told. <laughs> As mayor, Daly liked to build big things. He liked expressways, parking garages, high-rises, and anything else that required a ribbon-cutting ceremony and could be financed through federal funds. He wasn't quite as enthusiastic about small things, such as people. He disliked rebellious community organizations, critics of the mediocre school system, critics of any kind, or people who argued with him. Daly the public figure. Until he became mayor, Daly was known as a quiet, behind-the-scenes politician. When he started making speeches, it was clear why he'd been quiet. <laughs> he since developed two much improved styles of oratory, a controlled mumble for TV and an excited gabble for political rallies. <laughs> Daily the politician. He's old-fashioned. Other city machines got involved in civil service and other bad habits. They fell apart. The old-fashioned Daily organization controlled about 60,000 patronage jobs. Nepotism was big. Half the top office holders were sons of former office holders. Even the crime syndicate had its men in government. Everyone could join in if they did what they're told. It was truly democratic in a dictatorial sort of way. So, whom would he support for the nomination? Well, the mayor considered which candidate was the wisest, the noblest, the most inspiring, and the best qualified. And then he picked the one with the best chance of winning. In his parades, the politicians always marched up front. No matter how pretty they sounded, the flute players walked behind the horses. <laughs> One of those horses was Alderman John Holen. I heard him making a plea the other day for overtime pay for policemen and firemen. That was a nice thing to do, but he couldn't leave it at that. He had to emphasize his point in an unsportsmanlike manner. He said, Neither the policeman nor the fireman receives time and one half for overtime, even though the garbage truck driver does. Now, as some readers may recall, this column has campaigned against the practice of using garbage men as an arguing point for higher wages. For years, teachers, policemen, social workers, and others have gone before legislative bodies to ask for more money. One of their favorite arguments has been, Do you realize we earn less the same as or hardly any more than garbage men? Garbage men? The implication is that nobody in the world, especially a guy who wears a shirt, tie, and clean socks to work should be paid less or even the same as a garbage man. It's meant to shock the listener, to make him aware of the financial injustice. Well, this in effect is what Holden was doing. I don't know what the hell Holden thinks garbage men do all day. Maybe somebody told him they toe dance down the alley, sniffing backyard roses and listening to transistor radios. For his information, they spend all day messing around with garbage. G-A-R-B-A-G-E. Maybe the alderman doesn't know what that's like. If so, I invite him to go to the nearest alley, lift the lid from a can, and shove his head down inside. <laughs> Breathe deeply. Look around inside that can. Real sloppy mess, eh, alderman? That's garbage, sir. That's the stuff left over after the party or in the frying pan after you gobble up all the lean parts. Now look down that alley. As far as you can see, there are cans. That's the way it is all over. Hundreds of miles of alleys, thousands of cans, tons of garbage. And they see it all. Day after day, they empty the cans. They meet crawly things. They lose their sense of smell. The job has no status. They never hear a kid say, I want to grow up and be a garbage man. <laughs> what about us? Do we ever thank them? The little old ladies frightened by social changes write letters to the editor saying, God bless our garbage men. They deserve our support. Wake up, America. <laughs> what about us? We rush out at Christmas, love them a box of candy, a tie, a good book, or even a fifth? Nah. They empty the cans. We just fill them up again. Yeah, the garbage man doesn't complain. He just moves steadily down the alley of life, hauling away your leftover cheese dip. <laughs> The only time they ever hear themselves mentioned is when someone comes along and says, we earn less than garbage men. <laughs> if garbage men don't do that to other people, I never heard a garbage man say that we work hard, but we get paid less than aldermen and other loafers. 
I never heard a garbage man point out that the only time an alderman lifts something heavy and disposable is when he gets up and goes home. <laughs> garbage man could, but don't point out, you'll never catch two of them dividing up the day's collection. <laughs> I never heard a garbage man point out if they all walked out, the city be rocked by rodents, disease, and foul air, and if the aldermen walked out, the city be rocked by applause. <laughs> garbage men don't say things like that because they hang around in decent places, such as alleys, with decent people, other garbage men. Oh, and a nice man most of the time probably can't be blamed for what he said. It's like the mother always says to the judge, he's really a good boy, it's just the bad company he keeps. <laughs> Something I wrote about water and air pollution hurt U.S. Steel's feelings. An executive for the company wrote me a letter telling me I don't appreciate how hard they're working and how much they're spending to get rid of pollution. He was uh, nice enough to send copies of the letter to my bosses. He said, you've done a great disservice to a lot of hardworking and sincere people and to a company which has endeavored to operate as a good corporate citizen the more than 60 years it's been in existence feel like a bully for having picked on all those hard-working people, a good corporate citizen, an elderly citizen yet. So I'd like to apologize to U.S. Steel for picking on them. I had written that U.S. Steel's daily waste discharge into Lake Michigan had filled a bucket the size of the merchandise mart. And I'd said that $200 million it claims to have spent over the last 20 years was not enough. If it had been enough, there wouldn't be air and water pollution. But it's clear to me now that my logic was simple-minded and I was being terribly unfair. You see, I'm too dumb to understand high finance. That's why I thought uh, U.S. Steel was getting away with something. I thought all businesses operate basically the same way. You sell something, take the money, pay the necessary expenses, and what's left over is profits. A restaurant owner, for instance, could save money by tossing his garbage into a neighbor's yard or dumping it in the middle of the street. But he'd get in trouble, so he pays the scavenger service to haul it away as part of his overhead. Well, that led me to reason U.S. Steel ought to be paying whatever it takes to completely avoid dumping its garbage into my air or into my piece of Lake Michigan. That, I figured, is part of its overhead. But what I didn't realize is that they probably can't afford it, and they're doing the best they can. <laughs> I thought they had enough dough. But I've since had a chance to look over some of their financial records, and now I can see I was asking too much of U.S. Steel. <laughs> While it's clear they made a pretty good piece of money over the last 20 years, their total sales have been about $70 billion. That figure is deceiving. Out of that, they have to pay to help. Have to pay for upkeep of property, new property, social security, interest on loans, and all those other things that businessmen have to worry about. And they also spent $200 million, that's about one-third of 1% 1 of total sales, on eliminating air and water pollution. Well, by the time they got finished, there wasn't much left over. Their total profit for those 20 years, their take home, was only $4,700,000,000. That kind of nickel dime profit, I could see why they'd be limited to spending $200 million on air and water pollution. What the hell, they spent twice as much, their profits would have been murdered. All they would have had left is $4,500,000,000. That's not even walking around money today. Good corporate citizen might have had patches on his pants. So I'd like to say how sorry I am for having implied they were cutting corners on water and air pollution in order to show a big profit. It's clear they're spending every penny they can afford and they're trying their best. Hey, we get a spot or two in our lungs or lose a few at a Great Lakes. You can't blame U.S. Steel. Like the old saying goes, you just can't get turnip juice out of a turnip. <laughs> How you doing? 
Play the piano, huh? <laughs> you know Melancholy Baby? Everybody's a comedian. A young woman shrieked at me the other day. What makes you an authority on this subject? The subject she referred to was drinking. And what made her angry was my agreement with the raising of the legal drinking age to 21. As you might guess, she was 19. She'd come to me for sympathy. Instead, I told her I'd be happy I wouldn't have to trip over apple cheek little boozers in some of my favorite Chicago bars. <laughs> Brought color to her cheeks. They turned crimson when I said, in fact, I wouldn't mind seeing them raise the drinking age to 25, which is when she demanded to know what made me an authority on the subject. That was her mistake. There are thousands of subjects about which I know absolutely nothing. I write about them all the time. Thousands of others which I know next to nothing And thousands more which I know only a teeny bit But when it comes to the subject of people bellying up to a bar And making their livers quiver I am a recognized authority If they gave university degrees in this subject I'd be a PhD Harvard would make me a distinguished professor for God's sake In all modesty my credentials are brilliant Here's a very brief career resume. Age 13 to 19, position, bartender in various Chicago taverns. Now, I was able to obtain this employment despite my youth because I was hardworking, industrious, and my old man owned the joints. <laughs> Additional duties included accepting bets on horses, preventing customers from falling asleep with their head in the toilet, breaking up fights by unleashing a Doberman named Death and allowing him to gnaw on brawlers. <laughs> And finally, giving monthly cash-stuffed envelopes to a police bag man for assorted favors, such as overlooking a 13-year-old bartender. Age 19 to 23, served in the armed forces with distinguished duty in such theaters of operation as Billy Bob's Bar in Biloxi, Mississippi, <laughs> Jeb's Bar in San Antonio, Texas, Mr. Clegg's Private Moonshine Still in Bobo, Mississippi, Susie Wang's Bar and Bath House in Tokyo, and Kim Dong's Bar and Social Center in Korea. Experiences include being struck on the side of the head by a bottle in Billy Bob's Bar, on the other side of the head in Jeb's Bar, atop my head by Mr. Clagg's retarded brother, Crazy Clagg, <laughs> and becoming briefly engaged to a young lady I met in Kim Dong's Bar and Social Center, who decided instead to steal my wallet and boots. <laughs> Age 23 to present, engaged in field research in an estimated 3,267 cafes, bars, bistros, pubs, joints, and gin mills in Chicago, Milwaukee, San Francisco, New York, England, France, Germany, Cicero, and a few hundred other cities and countries. <laughs> Saw a one-legged man dance on a bar in Munich, got winked at by a one-eyed woman in Marseille, Went to the Shaller's Pump in Mayor Daly's neighborhood on St. Patrick's Day and escaped alive. <laughs> Saw a man in Milwaukee win a bet that he could drink a quart of vodka in five minutes and help put him in the ambulance. Saw a guy in Cicero wrestle a jukebox and lose. <laughs> but from all these experiences, I've acquired many sociological truths, a few of which I'll share. Never talk to someone who drinks with his eyes closed. <laughs> South of 12th Street, don't play the jukebox while the Sox game's on TV. <laughs> Never pet a tavern dog who has a purple tongue and yellow eyes. <laughs> Never flirt with a barmaid who has a purple tongue and yellow eyes. Her husband might be offended. But from all these experiences, the most lasting truth is this. It's based on scientific research done by many expert researchers such as bartenders, bouncers, traffic cops, ambulance drivers, and morgue attendants. 
They say that as drinkers, people in the younger age group drive wilder, hit each other with pool sticks more frequently and with less reason, and throw up on the floor more often than any other age group. <laughs> now, I don't know at what age this craziness subsides, but it isn't at an age at which someone, while completely sober, puts rear tires on his car that are twice as big as the front tires. <laughs> You know, the identity crisis has become a common ailment in our society today. People wonder who they really are. Sometimes they have to go off and find themselves. This occurs most often among young people. When it happens, they sing sad songs about it, renounce their parents' central air conditioning, smoke strange things, put flowers in their hair, eat an organically grown peanut or assume the lotus position. It happens to adults too, although not as often. Grown women raising small children seldom have an identity crisis. When a woman has diapers to change, she knows who she is. She's the person who changes diapers. But when the kids get older and go off to school, she isn't sure anymore, so she might go back to college, study philosophy, great literature, or ceramics. For a man, it's simpler. His identity crisis might hit him about 7.45 a.m. while stuck on the expressway with his son in his left eye. Then he might think, why the hell am I here? Why was I here yesterday? Will I be here tomorrow? In most cases, the man manages to change lanes and he feels better. <laughs> but if it becomes acute, he might clean out the joint savings account and go off to Las Vegas, find himself in the arms of a painted woman. Now, until recently, my knowledge of the identity crisis came from reading advice columnists and uh, other scientific journals. And from talking to my 17-year-old nephew, who is a guru, and is into a diet of organically grown guitar picks. <laughs> I never had an identity crisis before. I've always known who I am, which, while deeply depressing, <laughs> saved me a lot of running around looking for me. <laughs> and now I've had my identity crisis, and it came about in a strange way. Hoping to be one of the American journalists accompanying the president to China, I decided to get a passport. The State Department said you need a birth certificate to get a passport. It's a rule. I didn't have one. Didn't ever remember seeing it. A few occasions arise in which you must have written proof that you were born. <laughs> so I went to the office of County Clerk Edward J. Barrett, where all Chicago births are kept on file. Filled out the form, paid the guy $2. He went through the file, found the document, and handed me a Xerox copy. It was then my identity crisis exploded. Almost everything in the document was correct. The hospital, the date, the parents, except it said my name was Mitchell. Not Michael, not Mike, not any of the names I've been known by. Goofy, stop thief, hey you, creep, obnoxious, but Mitchell. <laughs> Went back to the counter and I pointed at the name and I said to the guy, what does this mean? He says, is this your birth certificate? Yeah. It means your first name is Mitchell. But nobody ever called me Mitchell. I suppose they called you Mitch. My head swam. At least it swam faster than it usually swims. How could my name have been Mitchell all these years without me knowing it? And if it was Mitchell, why have I always thought it was Michael? Several ideas came to me. Maybe the real Mitchell Royko had been misplaced by a nurse and a kid named Michael put in his crib by mistake. <laughs> you hear about hospitals doing such things. But if that had happened, who was I and where was he? <laughs> I pondered this a while and concluded it made no sense. Then I decided maybe twins have been born, one named Mike and one named Mitch. Ah, I would have noticed them as we grew up. We had a small flat. <laughs> Whatever the explanation, one thing was perfectly clear. I wasn't me. According to the office of County Clerk Edward J. Barrett, I was someone named Mitchell. And it could not be Mitchell since my name's Michael on my Playboy Club key. <laughs> but there was no record of the birth of Michael, so I wasn't either Michael or Mitchell. And who was I? Maybe Cup. <laughs> Despite the panic, I saw obvious benefits in having a new name. I could put an ad in the personals. Responsible for my own debts only, and not that other guy, Mitchell Royko, and off to Vegas. <laughs> 
That wouldn't solve the mystery and ease my identity crisis. So I went to older relatives and asked them if they remembered anything strange about my birth. Only you, one of them said. <laughs> but a relative remembered something, and I am convinced it's the answer. The doctor was called to St. Mary's Hospital from a wedding on Milwaukee Avenue. So he walked kind of funny. I think when he slapped you, like they slapped newborn babies to make them breathe, he might have slapped you in the head. Well, that explains many things, but uh, not the name. Yeah, but afterward, he and your father went over a place on North Avenue for a couple of drinks. To uh, celebrate. There are other reasons to drink. <laughs> Anyway, they had a couple of drinks. His English wasn't too good, so he probably wrote in the wrong first name. Ah, uh, well, I'm satisfied. That's the explanation. Undramatic as it may be. If he had to make a mistake, why couldn't it have been in the date? Just a change in one figure, and I could be 19, officially. <laughs> and I just brood about why a young kid like me has got falling hair. <laughs> You know, some kids lost their illusions sooner than others. But when it came to the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, nobody lost them any earlier than Slats Grabnik. He was a mere child, so young he hadn't started smoking. When he told his mother that he doubted that an Easter Bunny went around leaving candy-filled baskets for children, as he put it, anybody who can get in and out of that many houses without being seen is going to take up, not leave it. <laughs> Slats doubted the purpose of Valentine's Day as well. Valentine's Day was never one of Slats Grabnik's favorite events. He preferred Halloween when he could spring from dark gangways or drop from trees and unnerved pedestrians. He did this the rest of the year, too, but on Halloween, fewer people complained to his parents. <laughs> Valentine's Day never meant much to Slats because he didn't think much of girls, as he put it. When you hit them, they cry. They must be queer. <laughs> year after year, he's the only kid who never brought Valentine cards to class. Well, he brought envelopes, but they contained notes saying things like, This is your final warning. Give me a nickel or I'll bend your bicycle spokes. <laughs> Once a teacher mistakenly felt sorry for him and gave him the card, he promptly reported her to the principal saying, Next, she'll be molesting me. His mother used to tease him about his indifference toward girls. One time she asked him, Why do you think your father comes home at night? Slat thought about that a moment. Because the tavern closes? <laughs> Later, his mother worried about his attitude, so she consulted his aunt Wanda Grabnik, who was famous for her seances and readings of coffee grounds. And Wanda looked at Slat's palms for a long time, and she carefully felt his skull, and she concluded... He's dirty. Maybe a bath would help. <laughs> Slats' father tried talking to him. He thought Slats might appreciate girls if he explained the facts of life. Slats listened carefully, and he went to his mother and said, Get yourself a gun, Ma. He tries that stuff. No jury in the world would convict you. <laughs> but then it finally happened. A new girl moved into the neighborhood. Slats punched her on the arm, as he did with all newcomers, waited for her to cry. Instead, she threw a rock at his head. Slats found her irresistible. A change in him was remarkable. He began washing his neck every day, his ears every other day. Changed stockings every morning, switching them with his brother, Fats Grabnik. <laughs> he even poured great quantities of brillantine on his hair, although he still wouldn't comb it. But the girl didn't notice. So he tried to dazzle her with some of the athletic feet that had made him famous. What? And with a loud hissing sound, he'd spit through his teeth halfway across the street. A neighborhood record. But the girl wasn't impressed. So he tried a different approach. He stared at her. The way he'd seen Charles Boyer stare at a woman in a movie with one eyelid drooping. Slats would sit in school staring that way for hours. The girl didn't notice, but the teacher did, and she gave him better grades. <laughs> the staring routine backfired when the girl finally noticed him and screamed, but that was because it was almost midnight, and he was sitting in a tree outside her window. <laughs> well, that was when Slats worked up enough courage to actually talk to her. 
He decided to do it by phone, but when he called her and she answered, he was so confused, he just stood there breathing heavily into the phone. He was still standing there breathing heavily into the phone when the police traced the call and got out of the phone booth. They let him go after he promised not to do it again. It already cost me one nickel. I'm no playboy. In desperation, he decided to make her a handmade valentine. When the day finally approached, he asked his mother what it should say. She suggested he write something romantic. Slats nodded and began writing. It came to almost six pages. Put it in an envelope and took it to school, left it on the girl's desk. The girl read it, showed it to the teacher, who took it to the principal, who called in a juvenile officer. <laughs> That's the way my father explained it to me. <laughs> so they let him go. Well, that was the last time Slats tried being romantic. From then on, he threw rocks at the girl's head and stopped changing his stockings. His aunt Wanda nodded and predicted he'd marry young. Dear Prince Charles and Lady Diana, <laughs> the trumpets have stopped blaring, the incredible crowds have dispersed, you two have walked up the aisle in the most publicized and widely seen wedding in history, and now you are what you are, a young married couple. That gives you something in common with all the young lovers and older lovers of a world that sometimes seems loveless. You're really no different from the kid from the southwest side of Chicago, who's assistant manager of a pizza joint and his bride from Oaklawn who's going to nursing school. They might not have had the trumpets and the audience of millions, but their vows and their commitment are no different from yours. It's the most wonderful thing in the world, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And if you don't realize that, you're missing out on life's most glorious experience. That experience is very old. It goes back beyond recorded history. It goes back to some time before man could write or scratch pictures on walls when a male and a female found themselves in a cave or in the crook of a tree surrounded by the dark of the night, giving each other comfort, warmth, and security. This somehow became translated into something called love. Nobody's really sure what love is. Shrinks mess around trying to define it and just make it sound more complicated than it really is. Poets, as neurotic as they are, do a much better job. I'm not sure what it is myself, except that it leaves you breathless, makes everything else seem unimportant, and can cause you ecstasy, misery, and drive you crazy, and also drive you happy. I hope, despite your cool English manners, that this is what you feel. I hope both of you feel crazy and happy. Be warned, not going to be all kissy face and patty fingers and the nibbling of earlobes. There'll be times when she's going to be mad as hell at you. If not, she's yogurt or you're a saint. And there'll be times when she'll drive you up a wall. I hope so for your sake, or she or you will be about as exciting as a bowl of goldfish. When that happens, yell. That's right, yell. Tell her you're mad, and tell him you're mad. Get it out of your system. Mutter under your breath. Glare out the windows. Breathe loudly through your nostrils. Call up a close friend and complain about how impossible he or she is. Sit and brood about how you got yourself into such an impossible relationship. Daydream, if you must, about the perfect man or perfect woman you could have had. Then call it a day. Say you're sorry. Go to bed, hold each other all four, and wake up at the first chirp of the birds, glad to be alive and with each other. You'll find that to be one of the sweetest moments of your life. 
almost as sweet as awakening at three or four in the morning, seeing the other lying next to you, watching the moonlight playing on the other's body, you gently reaching out and putting your hand on the other's hand. I must warn both of you, you aren't going to spend the rest of your life, Charlie, lean, youthful, and clear-eyed. And you, Diana, you're not always going to have that fresh, ripened on the vine look. But in a few years, if you haven't become fools, she'll say to you, you're even more handsome now than you were before. And you'll tell her she's even more beautiful and desirable than she was then. And you'll mean it. And if you mean it, then it'll be true. You really are lucky, you know. Not because you're young and rich and famous. Those are strictly fringe benefits. You're lucky because you, I assume, are in love and are beginning a life together. That's more important than anything else you do. Your work, your place in history, the opinions, approval, or disapproval of others. Now when you're down, someone will take your hand and help you up. When you're crying, someone will dry your tears. When you're frightened, someone will hold and reassure you. When you're alone, someone will tell you you're not. That young prince and young lady matters more than all the ringing of the bells and blowing of the trumpets. It's something almost everybody wants and not everybody has. So kids, good luck. And don't blow it. And remember, squeeze a toothpaste tube from the bottom. Recognize the team. Now's the time to find out. Now's the time for the Cub Quiz. Bring the house lights up. <laughs> All right, the Cub Quiz. I'll ask the questions. You think you know the answers? Stand up. If you're right, stay standing after each question. If you're wrong, sit down and cheer for the Cardinals. <laughs> Don't expect your answer many questions correctly. I made up the test, and even I can't get them all right. <laughs> Five correct answers qualifies you as a true blue Cub fan and allows you to wear a Cub cap in pride. All right, once again, I'll ask the question. If you think you know the answer, stand up. If you're right, stay standing after each question. If there are any bumpkins out there who have had the Cub quiz before, shut up and give the other people a chance. <laughs> Number one, what position did Max Stang play? Answer. 
None. <laughs> he was Gravel Gertie, the immortal vendor. <laughs> Number two. Who was the most... Too easy. Number two. Name at least one Cub pitcher at a 1950s who wore a golden earring. <laughs> Answer. The immortal Fernando Pedro Rodriguez. He was undefeated as a pitcher in 1956. He also failed to win a game. <laughs> Number three. The Cubs once had a 38-year-old rookie in the 1950s. What was his name? Answer, the immortal Fernando Pedro Rodriguez. <laughs> Remember the guy with the golden earring? You bumpkins are miserable. Everybody on their feet for the seventh inning stretch. Let's go, everybody up. Up on your feet, let's go what Harry does in Wrigley Field, come on. <laughs> seventh inning stretch, everybody up, come on. Here we go, one, a two. Peanuts and Cracker Jack I don't care if I ever get back For it's root, root, root for the coffee If they don't win, it's a shame For it's one, two, three strikes You're out at the old ball Number four. <laughs> Which of these three players pitched a one-hitter during the 1945 World Series? Eddie Curly Cronin, Greg Sezag, or the immortal Dickie Gongola? Guess for crying out loud. What? <laughs> Yogi Berra is wrong. <laughs> I heard an answer there. Dickie Gongola is wrong. <laughs> None. <laughs> They're all my relatives and enjoy seeing their names in the paper. <laughs> Number five. The Cubs once had an outfield that was so slow they were known as the Quicksand Kids. Two of them were Ralph Kiner and Hank Sauer. What pathetic wreck played between them in center field? What? Somebody answered back there. What'd you say? I heard the answer. None is wrong. <laughs> it was a good guess, though. Frankie Baumholtz. He played during the mid-1950s, but as late as 1965 or something, he was seen laying in the grass in center field, catching his breath. <laughs> Number six. How long will this go on? Which of these two players always had sore feet? Heinz Becker or the immortal Dominic D'Alessandro? Becker had sore feet. All right, that's right. Somebody said it. Stand up. Who said Becker back there? Stand up. There you go. Get up. Up on your feet. <laughs> Make them stand up. All right, let's... <laughs> now, wait a minute. We got one more question to see if you can tie the bumpkin here. Last question. Somebody else see if they can get this to tie him up. Okay, that's good. <laughs> this guy wants a cub cat, doesn't he? <laughs> Name two radio or TV figures who were former cub bat boys. <laughs> Garrity. Vince Garrity is right. That's one. Got to have two, though. 
Walter Jacobson. That's right. We got to we split the prize there. Okay, you guys stand up. Both of them Here we go. Okay, wait a minute. Get up. Come on, get up. Got to get up now. Wait, hang on now. Stand up. What's the matter? You're on. No, no, we got three people. Everybody's got one answer right. We got a tiebreaker. First one that gets it right gets the cap. Here we go. When the ball goes over the left field wall in Wrigley Field, what street does it land on? Waveland. There we go. There's a winner right there. I'll get back to him. Give him that cup cap. He deserved it. Give him a hand. All right, good. You know, whenever I get depressed about the Cubs, I go fishing. I spend a lot of time fishing. <laughs> I don't fish to catch the fish. It isn't really a sport. Anything that can be played by a politician with a worm isn't really a sport. <laughs> you know, I had the great pleasure of witnessing many record-setting athletic performances during my youth. Because in my neighborhood, athletic competition was fierce. <laughs> One of my early heroes was Slats Grobnik. His bony frame and slack jaw belied his remarkable athletic instincts. Slats was only 16 when he set an endurance record by quitting school, going home, and staying in bed for six straight days and nights. <laughs> Eating only three meals a day and sleeping only between meals, Slats seemed like a good bet to keep going for a full week. Even his parents felt Slats was capable of greater things. Slats, his father said during the fifth day, why don't you go out and get a job? Well, after Slats awoke looking remarkably fresh, he was cheered by a group of admirers who had asked why he had not pushed on to a week or even a month. Can't stay in bed forever. I gotta go out to the beach and get a tan. Even his mother was not surprised by his performance. I always had a feeling he'd end up like this. After a short time, Lefty Sludge, 19, took the spotlight away from Slats when he announced he was going to set a record at the local bowling alley. Lefty's plan was to set pins for 24 hours straight, mainly because he needed the money. He said his father had lost his job, his mother was sickly, there were five younger children at home, and the whole family was living in squalor and poverty. He said he hoped to earn enough money to move to less depressing surroundings. <laughs> After only four minutes of pin setting, however, his record attempt ended when a bowling ball hit him in the head, addling his brain so that he later took to practicing law. <laughs> Even in failure, Lefty's attempt was the talk of the neighborhood until Archie Twitch, 19, got out of the house when his parents weren't looking and burst into prominence. After gathering a bushel of bottles and rocks, Archie climbed onto a garage roof where he set a record by single-handedly killing 13 rats. Many people felt he might have doubled this record had not his eyes become tired, causing him to bounce a brick off Mrs. Creep, <laughs> an extremely short neighbor woman who always wore a thick raccoon coat when she went through the alley. <laughs> she recovered from the injury and bore no grudge against Archie. Although she often let the air out of his bicycle tires. <laughs> there are other records, far too many to list in detail. Big Eddie, 15, who went 16 days without changing his socks. His brother Cecil, 17, who cut school and rode the subway for three days so he remembered where he'd got on. <laughs> and then there was Fats Boilermaker, 22, who once leaned against the corner light pole from 2 a.m. Sunday till noon Sunday when the tavern opened again. And then Willie Eber, 23, who once sat on a bar stool weeping and singing sad songs about mothers for 11 hours without getting one person to buy him a free drink. <laughs> Significant thing about all these records is that they were made without any help from grown-ups. You know, some grown-ups I know like to tell the story about the guy who fought Archie Moore. You remember the former light heavyweight boxing champion? Well, in the first round, Moore really slammed the guy. 
He hit him so hard and solidly he had to be carried unconscious from the ring. It took him about 15 minutes on the training table before he finally came to. And when he did, he staggered to his feet and lurched to Moore's dressing room, and he said, Mr. Moore, can I have your autograph? You know, I thought about that story when I read in Time magazine that President Reagan told visitors to his hospital room he's still against stricter gun control laws. <laughs> you might think that someone who had had a bullet removed from his lung might not feel kindly about a system of inadequate laws that allow a loony bird to easily buy a cheap handgun for the purpose of shooting a president. You might think that a bullet passing through the brain of his press aide might cause Reagan to reconsider his Death Valley Day's views on handguns. But not Reagan. His views on guns might be foolish, but whole in the chest and all, he's faithful to those foolish views. And that's why I was not overwhelmed by the sense of horror, shame, and guilt, some people say, swept the nation when TV brought the assassination attempt into our living rooms. I never feel overwhelmed when someone who opposes stricter gun control laws is shot. In fact, if the only people who were ever shot were those who favor easy ownership of handguns, I wouldn't favor handgun controls at all. <laughs> My attitude would be, if they want to shoot each other to pieces and leave the rest of us alone, let them. I tell them guns is cigar stands. <laughs> they tell us guns are good for fighting crime. If you have a gun, you can shoot a burglar. Of course, a burglar might have a gun and maybe he'd shoot you too. Or he might break into your house when you're not there and steal your gun. Then he might shoot a storekeeper and a cop. But they might arrest him, so the net result would be one storekeeper and cop shot and a burglar in jail. Guns are so effective as a crime-fighting device that the United States, with more privately owned guns than any other country, has the highest crime rate in the world. Now, what I don't understand is why I can legally own shotgun, rifle, or pistol, but I can't own other fine anti-crime-fighting weapons. Why can't I own a machine gun? I'm not much of a shot with a pistol, but I'm sure I could wing a burglar with a machine gun. I'd like to buy a surplus tank from the Army. Fully activated, of course. I'd like a tank because the gun people say we might have to fight off foreign invaders someday. Apparently, our Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and nuclear stockpile aren't up to the job. If that's the case, I'd feel more comfortable in a tank with my cannon blazing. You know, gun lovers love to instruct us that our right to build private arsenals is guaranteed by the Second Amendment of the Constitution. That's the one they always quote this way. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, actually, it doesn't just say that. The entire sentence reads, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, the gun lovers interpret this to mean in order to have a well-regulated militia, anybody should be able to own guns. Not having graduated from West Point, I don't know if that's entirely true. It does seem like a strange way to build a militia. <laughs> tradition is a big factor in gun ownership. I believe in tradition. So I consider the health department to be un-American. An even older tradition than the right to own guns is the right to keep pigs, chickens, goats, and cattle in your backyard, but they won't let me. Everybody should be able to keep pigs, chickens, goats, and cattle in their backyard. <laughs> High-rise apartments. Or office lobbies. <laughs> well, that way, if the communists ever take over our farms and meatpacking houses and try to starve us to death, they wouldn't dare to shoot it out with us because of our guns. We'll have a well-stocked food supply. I'd talk more about our precious right to own guns, but I have to go to a meeting of a committee to replace the torch in the Statue of Liberty's hand with a 22 caliber pistol. <laughs> So if you want to fight for your right to own guns, write a letter to the president. Quick, while he's still alive.
through no fault of my own, I own three cats. Wasn't my idea. One of my issue, afflicted with a soft heart, brought him home, rescued him one by one from the howling winds and deep snows. Even in July, that was his excuse. <laughs> Don't worry, this isn't going to be one of those cute stories about what it's like to own three cats. I have a large dog who chases them regularly. They spend most of their lives in hiding, and they're no problem. <laughs> However, a fourth cat has arrived, rescued from the howling winds, deep snows, etc. Now, I was raised to believe only a mad old recluse who saved tons of old newspaper in the parlor and concealed damp wads of money in the rusty can under the dusty bed would own four cats. I refuse to be pointed out as a mad old recluse. So the fourth cat must go. Now, I have a friend who has a tank full of piranhas. <laughs> You know those uh, hungry little razor-toothed cannibal fish from the Amazon River? Admittedly, they're strange pets, and he really doesn't like them. It's just that his landlord won't let him keep a python. <laughs> now, he says I may, if I wish, toss my surplus kitty into his tank. Now, I know this might offend kindly old ladies and sensitive children, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hold off feeding the nice little kitty to the hungry fish for a day or so, it's only about three months old, and my friend says could use some fattening up anyway. Well, that'll give anyone who wants to rescue it from the snapping jaws an opportunity to take it off my hands. It's a calico, by the way, and seems good-natured. So, if there are any little children out there, all you have to do is lean over to Mommy or Daddy and tell them they have to save the nice little calico kitty from the mean man in the newspaper. <laughs> because if someone doesn't, little children, it'll be snap, snap, gobble, gobble. <laughs> Right down to his curly tail. I swear I could write great TV toy commercials. You know, during the winter in Chicago, everyone has his own way of walking to avoid a fall. Some people use a fast shuffle, taking a dozen tiny steps for every yard advance. Others walk normally, but place their feet down carefully as if they're Checking for landmines. <laughs> then there are those that stay near the parked cars, hanging on to fenders and door handles. But in the end, nearly everyone falls. There must be an inborn knack to walking on ice and hard-packed snow. Some have it, some don't. Mrs. Peake used to have it. She may have been the most sure-footed woman this city ever had. In her own way, she was a great athlete, except no one ever gives awards for icy sidewalk walking. Circumstances required she go out every afternoon, even when she was in her 80s, and even in blizzards, and would have preferred to remain inside her flat, which was above a West Side War surplus store. She had to go out every afternoon because that was the only way she could get a couple of quarts of beer. She needed the beer for a health reason. Whiskey made her sick. <laughs> Even in the worst weather, when cars were snowbound and streets deserted, Mrs. Peake could be seen moving along the sidewalk toward that distant beacon, the beer sign. Speed was not her strong point. She made the outgoing trip in about ten minutes. The return trip took even longer because of the battle. But she never even appeared to lose her balance. Now, part of her success could probably be attributed to her physique. She was only four and a half feet tall and slightly less from side to side. <laughs> And when the snow was deep, she couldn't fall down because it propped her up. <laughs> because of her low-slung round figure, some people felt she probably had fallen down and simply rolled upright again. <laughs> but nobody ever saw this happen. Now, uh, she was also careful never to take a drink in the bar before beginning her return trip. She was afraid if she lingered there, a masher might get fresh. She said she distrusted most men, having operated a boarding house near West Madison Street in her earlier years. It was a respectable place, she boasted, and we never had a fire that killed anybody. <laughs> her no-fault record was also aided by the fact she never ordered more than two quarts. A variation in the weight might have thrown off her balance. Bartender once asked her why she didn't order three quarts instead of two. She explained... 
If you drink too much, it can become a habit. <laughs> One potential problem was that the grocer was a block more distant than the tavern. She got around this, however, by paying a neighborhood youth a nickel to get groceries for her when she needed them. This prompted her to observe that lawmakers could make life easier for elderly people by allowing children to buy beer in taverns. <laughs> ah, she never felt strongly enough to ask her representative to submit such a bill. The daily walk she took kept her in shape for the big trip she made once a month. That was when she rode three buses to a place near the loop to have her hair dyed red. She could have had it done in the neighborhood, but she distrusted the local place. She said she went there once, they left the machine on her head too long, and she got bald on top. This caused her to wear a flowered hat in the presence of other people. After nearly a dozen years and never seeing her fall, some people became curious about how she did it. Somebody even asked her, Opal, that was her given name, Opal, how come you never fall down? Why should I? <laughs> One day early afternoon rolled around and the barber noticed that Opal hadn't been past his place. He went next door to the cleaning store operator and he said, well, I guess Opal's dead. They called the police who went above the war surplus store and found her. She died in her sleep. They removed her flowered hat, took her to the funeral parlor. There was a pretty good turnout at the wake. Everyone agreed she'd been an upright woman. <laughs> you know, in case you missed it, Phyllis Schlafly was in Washington the other day to testify against stronger federal laws to protect women from sexual harassment on the jobs. She's against the laws because she says if a woman is sexually harassed, she probably brings it on herself. As she put it, when a woman walks across a room, she speaks in a universal body language most men intuitively understand. Men hardly ever ask sexual favors from a woman from whom the certain answer is no. <laughs> well, I have to disagree with Mrs. Schlafly, as I usually do. I'm no expert, but I've seen lots of women walk across rooms. I've seen many more women walk across rooms than she has because I spend more time at it while she's busy being a national nag on TV. <laughs> I've seen thousands of women walk across newsrooms, bar rooms, ballrooms, dining rooms, disco rooms, and just about any kind of room you can think of. I've seen them walk across restaurants, plazas, parks, and their husbands. <laughs> and I haven't the faintest idea just from watching a woman walk whether she is or is not a lady of easy virtue. Now, some women move their hips more than others, true. Is this due to a woman's virtue or the alignment of her bones or the way she was taught to walk as a child or the basic fact that she might have more hips to move? <laughs> Now, there are places in Chicago where men sometimes gather for purposes of girl watching. Some women, when they walk past these places, are subjected to whistles, panting, howls of, Hey, baby, how'd you like? Uh... Now, is this due to some universal body language that tells the men she is a woman of loose virtue? Or could it be that nature, or perhaps heredity, might have given her a 40-inch bust, 30-inch waist, 38-inch hips, and a pretty face? Now, I know of women, one hears things, who are plain in appearance, modest in bearing, remote in manner, and yet are said to have sizzling blood and wild instincts. <laughs> now, I also know of women, I told you, one hears things, who have flashing eyes, flouncing hair, bouncing bottoms, pouting bosoms, snake-like movements, and a wanton look about them, and yet are said to have blood that runs tepid. For that matter, I'm not sure what a virtuous woman is, although scores of grim-lipped biddies will quickly write to explain it to me. <laughs> As a youth, I thought I knew, because society standards, at least in my neighborhood, were simple. All females who remained chaste until married were virtuous, much admired by the neighborhood's married ladies. All other females were fallen women, much maligned by the neighborhood ladies, and much sought after by us guys. <laughs> As Slats Dropnik once put it, Why should I waste the price of a hamburger and a movie on a girl who don't know the meaning of the word okay? <laughs> I want to talk to somebody like that. I'll go to church and talk to a nun. It's cheaper. 
So any woman who defied the standards was known contemptuously as a slut, tramp, bum, or dozen other words. Meanwhile, any man who had the very same habits was known admiringly as a playboy, a dashing rogue, a lover, a real charmer, or simply as, what a guy. <laughs> but since the invention of the pill, everything's changed. Women marry later, and not at all. They take male roommates. They have flings, occasional or frequent. They are bold in making their desires known. Does this mean that any unmarried woman who is not a virgin isn't virtuous? No, I've... Uh, known women who have been, as they say in old novels, chaste. Some are also mean, cruel, nasty, bad-tempered, and malicious. Who the hell needs those kind of virtues? <laughs> and I've known women who've been around and intend to go around again. <laughs> Some are kind, gentle, good-hearted, considerate people. Those are virtues to be cherished. So I guess my definition of a virtuous woman and Mrs. Schlafly's definition are different. At least I hope they are. <laughs> As for women attracting all those passes, one final thought. Now, I'm sure Mrs. Schlafly's views are based on her own experiences, and I'm sure she considers herself to be a virtuous woman. And if men don't make passes at her, she probably believes it is her virtue that sends them the stern message that they should not even bother. <laughs> well, it might be her virtue that discourages them before they even try, but there could be another explanation why men don't make passes. Found in the lyrics of a rock song called Goodbye Stranger. It goes like this. Now, some they do and some they don't. Some you just can't tell. Some they will and some they won't. With some, it's just as well. <laughs> I remember some other ladies I met outside of Sayers School a number of years ago in Chicago. It was a beautiful morning, crisp and clear. On such a morning, the neighborhood took on added beauty because the homes were a deep, rich brown and the trees formed archways over the quiet streets. Sayre was a traditional-looking school. Big, made of dark yellow bricks surrounded by shrubbery, it filled half the block. The rest was open, fenceless schoolyard. The effect was that of a village square. Nobody was on the street. Most men had left earlier. Inside the houses, the women were getting the kids ready for school. At about 8.50, the school buzzer gave its first ring, traffic picking. Mothers dropped kids off, many parked and waited. And then came the sign wavers. About a dozen white women in their mid to late 30s. The signs were intended to let the Negro children know they weren't wanted, at least by this group of ladies. They were led by a bleached blonde who insists whenever we meet that she is not a bigot. After displaying the signs for the camera, she said knowingly, I suppose you know they burn the medical records of these colored kids. Why would they do that? Disease. And not the kind you get by being breathed on either. Her friends nodded. What kind of disease? Do you have daughters? Well, if you did, you'd know what we're talking about, and you'd be worried too. Are you talking about venereal disease? That's right. She said triumphantly. Baby. Her friends nodded again. There they stood on a beautiful morning while the flag flapped above them, convincing each other some sixth grade school children were bringing BD into their neighborhood. In these tepid times, there aren't many issues that can inspire a table thumping, loud voiced, wide eyed barroom debate. You're more likely to hear people discussing the deep meaning of Star Wars. But in a pinch, you can always stir up a lively barroom exchange simply by saying that Martin Luther King Jr. was a great American. Now, you have to be careful about provoking that particular discussion because it can get so lively, you might be thrown through the front window. However, we just passed the 17th anniversary of King's assassination. Memorial services were held here and there. But the best way to honor his memory is to get some people together and argue about him. That's what people did when he was alive, and that's probably what they'll always do when his name comes up. 
Even those who hated King have to admit that nobody could get their eyes bulging and temples pounding the way he did. So even for those who relish a good hate, he made a contribution. Now, if you aren't sure how to lead this particular discussion, here are some suggestions. Suggest that King will be remembered by history as one of the greatest Americans of our time, while most of his critics won't be footnotes or even smudges. Of course he was. He confronted the deepest evil in this country and did more to eradicate it in a few years than had been accomplished in a century. And he did this without being elected to any public office, leading an armed force, or committing nickel-dime burglaries. Suggest that King was a great patriot, although he didn't wear little American flags in his lapel or sing loudly before football games. But because of King, laws no longer permit millions of American citizens to be treated as subhumans because of their skin color. Because of that seemingly simple change, this is a better country today than it was 20 years ago. And a man who makes his country better is a patriot in my book. King was also a more law-abiding citizen than most of those who opposed him. True, he broke laws, but the laws he broke had racial discrimination built into them, which is why he broke them. And almost all have since been done away with. Now, in contrast, many of those who loathe King the loudest have been shown to be pretty casual when it came to some of our more serious laws. The nation's chief gumshoe, J. Edgar Hoover, was one. Under Hoover, the FBI had its own crime wave going. Hoover was so eager to prove that King and his followers were communists, which he failed to do, he revealed his own fascist streak. Hoover even tried to snitch to the mafia that civil rights leaders had said nasty things about godfather types. If Hoover has a place in history, it will be as a reminder that you should never let the store dick try to run the whole business. <laughs> Actually, it's hard to remember who King's prominent critics were. They've slipped back into obscurity, disbanded their posse. Those politicians who are still around have now adjusted to not calling grown men boy or praying that people without boots should pull on their own bootstraps. Now they say nothing at all about King or dribble an appropriate crocodile tear. This enlightenment has earned many of them new recognition as being moderate. To cap off any lively discussion, the king suggests he was a better Christian than most of those who despised him, and he was. The man actually tried to live by what Christ taught. That's why he was marching in the street, sitting in jail, stirring people up. Many of those who jeered King thought of themselves as fine Christians, too. The king's movement began in the South Bible Belt, and when he came north, he marched into church-going neighborhoods. When both sides confronted each other, it was hard to believe they'd all been taught from the same book. But had Christ been here, he surely would have been walking on King's side not shooting with people with rifles or fire hoses or burning crosses or trying to retain inhuman laws, all of which many good hymn-singing, pancake-eating, Sunday-morning Christians took part in doing. Had Christ been here during King's movement, he might have been denounced from a few Christian pulpits, as was King, for not being a good Christian. That would have caused some theological confusion. <laughs> Had Christ been here during King's movement, he might have been shot, too then we could have argued about whether he was right or wrong. But in a way, we're still doing that anyway. You know, at one time, I thought I might become editor of the Daily News. That was an ambition of mine. It's the only goal I had other than doing my column. Now I don't care anymore. I work for the Tribune. I have no role in the paper other than doing my column. It's more of a job to me now than it used to be. I'll write the column for another year or so till the contract runs out. I don't know if I'll sign another contract. I don't know if I want to keep on doing a column. Hey, if I had clout, I could quit and go fishing the rest of my life. <laughs> With real clout, maybe I could manage the cub. 